It's such a disappointing turnout. I think the least we could have done is shown Jeffrey Sachs the respect of filling out the room, as we clearly have. Um, we all know about the Occupy movement of Wall Street, and uh, when that took off, there were a lot of people that didn't know what to make of it. Uh, mainstream journalists, uh, the CBC was among them, were baffled by it. Politicians thought it just wouldn't last. People in finance and economics rolled their eyes at how naive those occupiers seemed. Jeffrey Sachs went down to Zuccotti Park in Manhattan to the Occupy site, right to the original uh, Occupy Wall Street place, to say thank you. And he told those occupiers, you are changing the direction of this country, and you are the first to do it in a very long time. You got the right message. We, are, we really are the 99% and the 1% doesn't get it. So keep telling them the truth. They are a little slow, but they will eventually get it. Jeffrey Sachs is the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, a special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He has helped to solve many of the world's most daunting economic and social crises, and he's with us tonight to talk about his latest book, The Price of Civilization, Economics, and the Ethics economics and ethics after the fall. Please welcome to the stage, Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs, welcome to Toronto, welcome to Canada. I'm delighted to be here. When this uh, Occupy movement began, you clearly wrote the book before it because there's no reference to it. But it's so prescient. I mean, even the language that the young people are using in the Occupy movement is the language of your book. I mean, you could actually offer this as the manifesto for the Occupy movement. What did you think when you first heard that battle cry, when they first went down to Zuccotti Park? I thought, good stuff, you know, uh, way overdue. I turned my book in uh, early uh, 2011, so uh, uh, the Occupy movement uh, started several months later. But the last chapter of this book, uh, called The Millennials, uh, said that if we're going to have a turnaround, it won't come from my baby boomer uh, generation. It's going to come from young people. And uh, I feel uh, even more that that's the case now. Uh, the baby boomers, uh, that's me, uh, that's us. I'm, I'm on the young side of the baby boomers. Say Bill Clinton's on the older side of the baby boomers. Um, I don't think we did a very good job. Uh, this was the generation of affluence, uh, and it became uh, pretty greedy and short-sighted in terms of politics and policy, and uh, it has created one big mess and now I think it's a, a younger generation uh, that has a lot of different tastes and talents, especially social networking, a lot of openness, a lot of uh, uh, tolerance, uh, a lot of uh, living with diversity that's going to be cleaning this up. And you call them the millennial generation. If you could just, just describe, you've started it there, but just... Who are they? What's the age group that you think they're in? And what, what do you think they can accomplish in this Occupy movement? Well, when I, when I wrote about the millennials, that's a group uh, that is usually put at uh, between 15 and 30. Uh, and uh, they're uh, the young people in my classes because I've seen on the campuses, uh, and I not only see my own uh, students in class, but I visit a lot of universities in the United States and Canada and other places in the world. I've, I've felt for a number of years that there is a new social consciousness, a new sense of activism, uh, less uh, cynicism. Uh, our political system is so dominated by cynicism. Uh, and. Uh, somehow there's a confusion that cynicism is being clever. Uh, cynicism is not clever. Cynicism uh, is, uh, is, is defeatist. Uh, it's just negative. <laughs> and uh, uh, young people don't have that. And especially since I've watched the, the wave of this over the years, the campuses really were very quiescent for 
20 years, I would say, from the, the mid-80s to uh, the uh, middle years of, uh, of the first decade of the 21st century. But then I felt a lot of energy, whether it's on fighting global poverty, whether it's on the uptake of challenges of global health, and then after 2008, about the unfairness of our societies and the need to, need to get politics uh, right again. You wrote this book, The Price of Civilization, as it's been billed as the first time you have turned to write about your own country, about the United States. We have been following you for decades in the writing you've done, the work you've done in 100 countries. Uh, and, but now you needed, you felt compelled in these past couple of years to turn your attention to your own country. Why is that? Why did you need to write this book? You know, I, I started work uh, in the early 1980s and especially in the mid 80s working in Latin America in the middle of hyperinflations and the beginning of a restoration of democracy after all the military coups that took place from the 60s and 70s in Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru and so on. And so I was there and trying to help uh, the return to democracy and so on. I always felt proud at the time that as an American, I was coming from a democracy, a country that had a tradition of helping. Uh, there was still the idea that uh, rich countries should help poor countries. Uh, there was a sense, I thought, of uh, responsibility. The Marshall Plan was an ancient history. It was something that Americans could uh, still take pride in. Over the next quarter century, I watched that ethos disappear. Uh, George W. Bush, my least favorite president uh, of all, I consider him the worst president in American history, with the possible exception of James Buchanan in 1856, and I just don't know enough. I don't have the feel of uh, Buchanan, but um, he's definitely near the bottom. Uh, he didn't mention the Millennium Development Goals but once uh, that I know of uh, in his eight years as president, and I felt you know, that's pretty rotten, the withdrawal of U.S. leadership, the sense of the U.S. as just an increasingly militarized society. I was a huge fan and supporter of President Obama. Uh, as Senator Obama and uh, my kids were out there campaigning and knocking on doors and canvassing, and I was so thrilled when, when uh, he was elected. I was with Ted Sorensen who was a hero of mine, uh, John Kennedy's uh, speechwriter, the, uh, the, the night of the election. I, Ted and I hugged each other, and it, it seemed a glorious moment. And then very little changed. And of course, the combination of an economic crisis, then what I thought was very bad management of that crisis, a president who had campaigned on change, who changed very little, uh, an America disappearing from global leadership, in, in my view, uh, a lot of hurt in American society, and frankly, uh, I was not too happy with most of my colleagues uh, in academic economics, and I watched the same movie as uh, everyone else, The Inside Job. Um, I, I know those people, and uh, that movie is right. Uh, and I watched the corruption of economics departments. I left economics departments in 1996 because I got disgusted with Harvard's economics department. I didn't want to be there full time because I just felt it was more and more divorced from, from the realities that I was seeing. And when I've joined Columbia, I've been lucky to be uh, in, uh, in the Earth Institute, which is uh, quite a different kind of place. But you add all this together, the, the decline of U.S. leadership, these terrible wars, uh, especially the Iraq war, an unprovoked war launched on a, on, on a, a stack of lies uh, so grotesque that you can't imagine a, a, a country can fall prey to this. Uh, a political system that seems uh, so immutable to change the disappointment of uh, a president who campaigned on change uh, and then brought in the same uh, Wall Street people who had made the disaster uh, in the first place and my feeling that the economic policies that they were pursuing, even though these were my guys, this was my team, this is the one I voted for, was not right at all. 
And by the way, the other side's much worse. So, uh, you know, I'm on a spectrum here where uh, I expect to vote for President Obama again, uh, but not happily. Uh, but the other side, when we get started, I'll tell you about the other side. Uh, it's absolutely unbelievable that what would have been a fringe really a fringe is now one of the two main political parties in the United States and it's just a party of greed and nastiness to the core and so all of that is to say God I had to figure out what's going on in my own country it's not that our crisis is anywhere as deep as uh, as uh, the Horn of Africa where I spent a lot of my time this summer people are starving to death there uh, there are much worse economic conditions elsewhere. The basic reason why I went into international economics still holds for me, which is the, the most life and death problems are abroad, but the collapse of decency in the United States, the rigidity of the political system, the continuity between a, a Bush and an Obama, shocking. Uh, the, the fact that without U.S. leadership, the world is also in a mess. Not that the U.S. was getting much right, but the withdrawal of the U.S. from these issues is a very dangerous thing, but it's so palpable. If you see like I do, I go to the G20 summits, I go to, I see all of it up close, and it's amazing to me, the incredible disappearing superpower. The last thing we're holding on to is our military bases and our wars, but everything else we're basically giving up right now. So you got to write. I mean, you have to try to figure out what's going on in, in a context like that. You write in your opening line, it, you say, there can be no doubt that something has gone terribly wrong in the United States. And that you trace that not, you go, it's not 2008, the financial crisis, it's not Obama, it's not George Bush. Where you trace the root of where this turn happened, where the beginning of what you believe this malaise comes from, goes into the 70s and early 80s and begins, you lay most of it, that beginning, the roots of it, at Ronald Reagan's feet. If you could just tell us why, where you think it happened. When did the turn happen where the United States lost this, its soul, I guess? You know, I'm really not partisan, though I tend to vote you know, for Democrats, but I'm not looking for a job in Washington and I'm not uh, out to game or to spin the American politics. And so, I'm pretty disgusted with both sides, actually, though I have to keep rem reminding everyone, one side's really bad. <laughs> the other side's just profoundly disappointing. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, as I was thinking about what to write, I was going to write about the 2008 financial crisis. Then there were two problems with that. One problem was about 50 books appeared in the first three weeks. Okay, uh, that's fine. But, th but the deeper problem is the crisis obviously had its roots uh, in a bubble that started way back when. And, and it had its roots in, in Bill Clinton uh, and uh, what he represented. You know, another one of my side. Uh, he was the one that brought uh, Bob Rubin to be, you know, straight from Goldman Sachs chairman to the White House. Not good. Uh, and uh, then to have Rubin write the deregulation of Wall Street and then to join Citigroup as number two, the very firm that he enabled, then to make $126 million, then to sit next to Obama, candidate Obama, the day after the financial crisis broke. Not good, you know? Really not good. But that takes us back, back, back. Where did this start? How did this happen? Now, of course, America's always been a country of money and politics. We've had our scandals, our crises, and so on. But truly, it's not just the imagination of a, uh, you know, uh, a uh, young person growing up in the Kennedy uh, age. America was different at a time. We actually took on big goals. We, we had a president, Lyndon Johnson, who made a war on poverty. Unthinkable in America right now. Really unthinkable. We have a war on the poor. I mean, really a war on the poor. And we have candidates disdaining the poor. You don't have a job, get a job. That's kind of the attitude of Herman Cain. You know, a man, nobody is less equipped to be president of the United States than this man. 
And he's a leading candidate. It's unbelievable. Okay, you have to figure out what happened. Now, my take on this is that things really started to go wrong in the 1970s. Again, there's an accidental problem, which was Richard Nixon, but I'm not even talking about that. That's a phenomenon of its own. Uh, but that's actually not the problem. The problem is that I think the 1970s was the beginning of a new world economy for all of us, for Canada, for the United States. It was the beginning of real globalization. And mind you, I'm a kind of fan of globalization because in its best impulse, globalization means that good ideas and technology and the chance for improvement spread all over the world. And I've watched, actually, with my own eyes since I first visited China in 1981, it's been 30 years of watching, the most remarkable growth of an economy of 1.3 billion people that the world has ever known. And I think it's actually quite marvelous with all its problems. But it's tough globalization. It changes everything about our economies. And in the US, for example, already starting in the mid-1970s, the earnings of full-time male workers reached their peak because the competition from abroad meant that the traditional route to the middle class, graduate high school, maybe spend another year of uh, further classes, go to the local factory, buy a, a house in, in the suburbs. That was the American way after World War II. That closed down already by the mid-70s. 1979 was the peak employment in manufacturing in the United States. 19 million jobs in manufacturing. Now we're at about 10 million. That's globalization to a very large extent. Okay, there are good sides, but there's dislocation. The job of government is to make sure that a phenomenon so deep and so powerful can be shared on the beneficial side by everybody. That if you need new skills, new training, new kinds of education, new infrastructure, new technologies, that society as a whole shares in the benefits. That's what a normal political system would do. But we didn't get a normal political system. We got Ronald Reagan. That was a game changer. Of course, as I emphasize in the book, Reagan represents deeper phenomena. It's not just an individual. But Reagan said something that I think is absolutely fateful, uh, awful for America. He said it on January 20th, 1981, his inauguration day. He said, Government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. The famous statement, my response to that is, if you believe it, please don't run for the presidency. <laughs> because that job should be reserved for people who actually believe that government is to solve problems. What Franklin Roosevelt called the instrument of collective purpose. That's what government is for. But we had globalization starting to create inequality in America. And then comes government and absolutely doubles down on these tendencies by having a president who says, we're not going to help. Not only that, we're going to slash the top tax rates from 70% to 28%. And we're going to slash social programs at the same time because we don't believe in them. We're going to bust the unions when he fired the air traffic controllers and appointed the National Labor Relations Board to absolutely foster an anti-union environment in the United States. And you watch, if we had a graph here, but you'll have to read the book uh, to see, uh, that's when our inequality starts to soar in the United States. And so market forces alone would have been enough of a problem, but market forces plus Ronald Reagan started a trend in the United States, which we're still on 30 years later. And that trend is massive inequality, 
A government that has the backs of Wall Street, the private health insurers, the military armaments industry, big oil, but doesn't have the backs of the American people anymore. We have now the top 0.01% of American households, that's 12,000 households out of 12 million, 12,000 households take home 5% of all household income, more than the poorest 24 million households. The net worth of the richest 400 Americans exceeds the net worth of the poorest 120 million Americans. 400 to 120 million, because the poorest 120 million have no net worth, and the top are billionaires. And I don't know what you do with a billion dollars. The only good I can see from it is you get on Forbes' list. What could you do with this? How many houses, mansions, yachts, private planes, Gulf Streams do you really need? But they are completely obsessed with climbing up this list. And this is what Reagan unleashed. And the shocking thing, Carol, is that it has gone on for 30 years. That's the next part of the puzzle. You start with globalization, then you get this misguided idea that it's government that's the problem. You start on that road, and then the next puzzle is why does this continue? Through Bush Sr., through Bill Clinton, who after all ended welfare as we know it, which was uh, throwing poor women out on the streets without any help. So go get jobs. No child care, no other support. You go get jobs. You get up at 4.30 a.m. so you can go two hours or three hours to a minimum wage work, and where's your child going to be? What kind of safety? No answers to that in America anymore. And this continues, of course, through George W. Bush, Jr. And the shocking thing, it continues through Obama. And I'll explain it if you ask me. <laughs> I want to ask you about, you set up, you actually have several questions I want to ask you about that you've left in there. And one of them is that, why then? Why, why does it continue? It's not like they make it a secret. It's not a secret that they will protect this 1%. It's not, they, in fact, they campaign. Both Democrats and Republicans say that we were not, we're, we're going to give tax breaks to the 1%. At least Obama said that we'd give tax breaks to everyone but the 1%, and then he agreed, all oh, right, all right, because it was so popular. This is the, the, the thing that is the most perplexing that you get into in this book. Why is it that Americans go, yay, let's vote for the party that wants to make the biggest tax cuts when you're facing a multi-trillion dollar debt? Yeah, it's, it is, um, it's complicated because actually, kind of an amazing thing. I didn't really realize it until I was writing the book. I went back and I read all the opinion polls that I could find about the question of extending the Bush era tax cuts. You'll remember George Bush gave three rounds of tax cuts, uh, ending up with the top tax rate for the richest Americans on quote, normal income, 35%, and on capital gains, 15%. And for the richest of rich Americans, the hedge fund guys, like John Paulson, they also pay a top rate of 15%. Unreal. It's called carried interest. It's, don't even try to theorize about it. It's just purely the corruption of American politics. Nothing more than that. Now, the interesting thing was the following. These tax cuts were made to last 10 years when they were written, and the 10-year period ended in December 2010. So uh, Obama and, uh, and, and uh, Congress were discussing, negotiating what should be done. President Obama said, we need to keep the tax cuts for everybody except the top, the, the very top. Uh, and we'll let that bracket go up to 39.6%. By the way, not very impressive when the big gap between your two political parties is 4.6 percentage points of, of uh, rich people's uh, top tax rate. But then, lo and behold, they extended it. 
Period. I happened to be in the White House the next day. I can tell you, they were not unhappy with that agreement, by the way. Whatever they said, they were not unhappy. Uh, the president said, mm, it was hard, we didn't have, you know, <laughs> Democrats, it was kind of divided. His aides were, did you see that deal we got? Because they were so happy they got more stimulus of tax cuts and a payroll tax cut, they thought they had a great deal. It was shocking, actually. It was kind of gutting the soul of the Democratic Party one more time. I don't know how many times you can do it, but they, keep, they kept doing it. So why? Why did that happen? So I went back and read all the opinion surveys. 60% of Americans were against that action. They wanted the top tax rates to go up. It wasn't that his back was to the wall politically. It's that American opinion doesn't matter in our politics anymore. No one's listening to the 60%. They're barely listening to the 99%. It's the 1%. Because that's the ones paying for these campaigns. And, you know, my experience with my wife is we're riding in a cab on the on uh, the FDR uh, highway on the east side in Manhattan, and a traffic jam, this is every two or three months. Big traffic jam. Okay, what's going on? President Obama's coming in to have dinner on Wall Street. Honestly, that's where the campaign financing is going on. This isn't announced as big news. It's kind of slinking into the Four Seasons Hotel, or the Four Seasons Restaurant, or, or some, East, uh, uh, east side uh, uh, salon or something for the president. All $35,800 a plate because that's what the U.S. law allows. Not, not a lot of people coming from Harlem for that $35,800 a plate. And so the real reason this stays on is not that the American people want it. The real reason it stays on is that the politics has really become so corrupt it's legalized corruption. If we saw this in, in a developing country, we'd be shocked, we'd be scandalized. But we're inured to it. It's happening just before our eyes, like you say. And it's big money. The Republicans love it. These are the job creators. Yes, all those great job creators at Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, uh, and everyone else who destroyed uh, millions of jobs uh, and trillions of dollars of wealth. They're great job creators. The Democrats are a little different. They agree to the same thing, but they wring their hands doing it. Oh, we don't like doing this, but we just have to keep the tax rates low. You know, those are the difference of our two political parties. But both of them are listening to these miserable political advisors. This is the profession I least like uh, in our country, the David Plouffe types. Because the president, you know, first of all, president should govern and he doesn't need David Plouffe in the White House. In fact, he needs him not in the White House. So that he can think about what's good for America, not be told morning, noon, and night, no, you can't do that. You have a campaign finance appearance tonight. You're meeting this guy, this Wall Street, he's a key bundler. You, you know, you mustn't say this and that. It's both political parties. And in America, it's much worse than Canada. Canada's got a lot of this too. But Canada's got a lot more control on this. The campaigns don't cost much, they're shorter, uh, there's public financing, there are limits. This cycle coming up for 2012 is expected to cost between six and seven billion dollars at the federal level. How can you have a democracy where you need six to seven billion dollars of campaign financing? The answer is you can't. You can have the veneer of democracy, but you can't have democracy.